Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Jillian Bloomfield and I work for the Environmental Leadership and Training Initiative at Yale University, otherwise we call it LT. I'm very pleased to welcome you today to the second lecture in the eight-part webinar series, Capacity Development for Forest Landscape Restoration. LT is an initiative of Yale's School of, Envi of the Environment, which receives generous support from Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin. We're a global team of individuals and partner institutions who work to train and support people from all sectors and backgrounds to restore and conserve tropical forest landscapes using strategies that support both biodiversity and livelihoods. As we mentioned last month, our team really wanted to offer this series to share with you all some of the key approaches and lessons learned from capacity development from the work of LT staff, affiliates, and alumni working worldwide. With everyone in various levels of lockdown, we are really grateful for these on way, online ways to connect and the ways to exchange knowledge and ideas. So today's presentation is entitled The Vital Role of Extension Services, presented by Dr. Alicia Calle. Dr. Calle is a postdoctoral associate at Yale with over 10 years of experience working at the intersection of tropical forest restoration and agroecology. In both her applied and research work, she seeks to understand how different forms of incentives contribute to and engage farmers in the use of sustainable production and conservation practices. Uh, she holds a PhD from Yale from a PhD from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and a master's from the Yale School of the Environment. So Alicia, we're so glad to have you here today. Uh, we will have time for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. So please submit your questions using the Q&A feature during the presentation. So thank, with that, thank you and welcome Alicia. Thank you, Jillian. <clears throat> Okay, is my screen sharing fine? Yes. Okay. Well, hello everybody and thanks for joining me today for this discussion about the vital role of extension in ongoing large scale restoration efforts. <clears throat> In this talk, I'm going to be discussing the global restoration commitments and the approach known as forest landscape restoration. Then I'm going to talk about the conventional extension model and some of its shortcomings. Then what an extension model for forest landscape restoration could potentially look like and illustrate this with a case study from a project in Colombia. As you all know, uh, in recent decades, many governments have been committing to restore large areas of land. Uh, and this as a result of governments increasingly uh, recognizing that people depend on the variety of goods and services that healthy ecosystems are able to provide. So uh, they have decided that it's time to start repairing some of the damage that we have already caused. To fulfill these commitments, many countries have uh, embraced an approach to restoration known as forest landscape restoration, which is defined as the ongoing process of regaining ecological functionality and enhancing human well being across deforested or degraded forest landscapes. So the approach of forest landscape restoration is different in very important um, ways. One of them is that it recognizes the need to restore the entire landscape as opposed to just a few sites. And the other one is that it recognizes that it's not only important to conserve biodiversity, but also to fit human needs. So it's perhaps this human-centric approach to restoration what has been appealing to many governments because this approach recognizes that people actually need to use the landscape and that restoration needs to accommodate productive land uses, that is agriculture. So what does doing restoration at this huge scale entail? Well, we know that globally, there will be some opportunities to restore large areas of forest. But we also know that most, the vast majority of opportunities for restoration are in agricultural and pastoral lands, what we call working lands. 
So the idea is to use a variety of sustainable management approaches to create a mosaic of land uses. And I want to highlight here that agriculture definitely has a very important role to play in the whole forest landscape restoration approach. Now, uh, despite the good intentions and the promises, many countries are lagging behind in fulfilling their restoration commitments, and this is for a variety of reasons. Some of them pretty simple, the fact that some countries have overcommitted to restoring, for example, 75% of their total land area, which is not very reasonable. Uh, but then there's the other usual reasons, as you see in this diagram. There's lack of financial resources and investment. There's lack of governance and political will. There is lack of baseline assessments and information of where these restoration projects need to happen. There are problems with um, the technologies and approaches to do restoration at such a large scale. And then there is this one, capacity development of it and extension, which is usually mentioned as a side note, but rarely gets discussed in depth, which is why I wanted to focus on this topic for this presentation. Now, the lack of capacity to development and extension is not exclusive to forest landscape restoration. Actually, it has been plaguing restoration projects for decades. This recent study from Colombia concluded that of all the restoration uh, projects that they examined, there was uh, a generalized marked absence of planning for, among other things, capacity building and extension. So, Although countries have been implementing restoration projects and spending millions of dollars in these projects, as you can see in the graph, we are very far behind in achieving any of the targets, right? And the reason is that restoration projects often fail because there is a lack of knowledge and technical capacity of how to implement these projects. So what is clear is that some system of capacity development and knowledge is really needed for FLR to take off. So that's bring, that brings us to extension, right? And what do we mean by extension? There are many definitions, but here's a simple one. It's the transfer of mostly agricultural information and technology from researchers to farmers, and similarly from farmers back to researchers. Now, extension is really old. It dates back to over 2000 years ago in China, but the reality is that most extension services in place today around the world are modeled uh, after the cooperative extension service that was founded in the United States in 1914, which has been operated by land grant universities in conjunction with agricultural experimental st stations. And the idea of the cooperative extension service was to take the knowledge that was being created in these universities and extend its reach beyond the universities. The model that was developed in the land grant universities <coughs> had a very simple goal, that is to bridge the gap between science and practice. Science takes a long time, it requires controls, it requires replication, while practice, the farmers, they need immediate and well-tested solutions. And that bridging of the gap, it wasn't happening. So in comes the extension agent, whose mission it is to take all the knowledge that the scientists are creating and translate it in a way that is palatable to farmers and to take that knowledge directly to the farmers as you see in the picture and demonstrate how things are done. And he also takes back questions and any kind of other problems that farmers are having with these technologies. So this is why this is referred to as a transfer of, te of technology or technology transfer model. A reality is that that system of extension worked pretty well for things like the Green Revolution, where uh, scientists were coming up with this like one size fits all solution to a problem that was meant to be implemented across the board. But in the developing world, that hasn't worked so well. There has been uh, little uptake of these technologies in large part because the technologies do not fit the context of, these, of many of these places. So critics of these conventional extension models or methods have pointed out that 
The reason it doesn't work is because uh, the conventional extension model values Western science over other forms of knowledge because it's a very hierarchical system that precludes any type of dialogue and horizontal transference of knowledge. That it takes a very reductionist approach to solving problems. That it has a very narrow focus on yield exclusively. That it ignores largely social, ecological, and economic contexts. And that it is persuasive and paternalistic instead of educating people and allowing them some participation in devising the solutions to the problems. So what these critics have been saying is that the problem is not having an extension model. The problem is that we need another process of constructing knowledge that is able to take the ecological knowledge that farmers already have and take into consideration their value systems and their culture. So how is this related to large-scale restoration efforts? Well, as I pointed out before, if most of the opportunities for large-scale restoration are on landscapes like this, working lands, and are managed by individuals and communities, then in order to achieve scale at this uh, change at this large scale, we need at least two things to happen. The first one is there needs to be significant stakeholder engagement because it's the people who are actually going to implement the changes. So they need to be interested and engaged in this process. And the second one is these people need to scale up the adoption of sustainable land management, both in their agricultural areas and in the lands that are used for conservation or restoration. And this is where extension comes in. We know from a variety of studies of extension in different aspects of natural resource management that extension can help in certain aspects. When it is correctly done, it can reduce the risk and uncertainty that are associated with the introduction of unfamiliar practices. It can motivate farmers and boost their confidence and ownership of the projects. It can increase farmer engagement. It can build relationships of trust between farmers or stakeholders and institutions. In some cases, it can facilitate access to credits and inputs, and it can increase the chances of permanent adoption, which is ultimately the goal of extension. So we have to ask, does the conventional extension model that is widespread meet the needs of forest landscape restoration? And for this, you can compare conventional extension here on the left with the principles of forest landscape restoration. And you will see that there is a misalignment. For example, FLR focuses on restoring the entire landscape, while conventional extension often focuses at the plot or farm scale. FLR seeks to maintain and enhance the natural ecosystems in the landscape, but conventional extension tends to focus only on the productive systems. FLR wants to engage st stakeholders in a participatory way and conventional extension is very top-down and paternalistic. FLR uses a variety of approaches and emphasizes tailoring to the context, while extension, conventional extension focuses on delivering pre-established technical packages. FLR wants to restore a variety of different functions and benefits, but conventional extension focuses on one objective, and that is yield and productivity. And FLR wants to manage adaptively for the long term, and conventional extension wants to manage in a very preset way for short-term productivity. So as you can see, perhaps conventional extension is not the answer to forest landscape restoration, but that doesn't mean that extension is not needed. So conventional extension is based on what we know as the conventional knowledge system, which has its own epistemology or way of seeing the world, it has its own learning methodologies and support systems, and that works well for conventional agriculture. But what many critics of this system have suggested is that perhaps we need an ecological knowledge system and an extension system that is modeled after this ecological knowledge system. What do I mean by this? I mean that an ecological knowledge system, for example, would admit that there are multiple truths, not just Western science. It would view ecology 
as humans being part of nature and affected but by whatever they do to it, as opposed to humans having the right of modifying nature at, at their will. An ecological knowledge system would set a, uh, a group of general principles and adapt them to specific context, while conventional knowledge system focuses on a single approach. An ecological knowledge system would uh, emphasize horizontal and collaborative learning and experiential and context-based learning. The support system for an ecological knowledge system would have to encourage local solutions and innovation as opposed to simply the adoption of technological packages. And it would reward land stewardship in the long term rather than short term productivity. So it could be possible to design an extension system based on these principles. So what would an extension model for FLR look like? Well, in the first place, it would have to shift the focus from teaching to learning and uh, privilege practice over theory. It would have to facilitate networks of horizontal learning from peer to peer. It would have to use a variety of methods and have them be tailored to the local context. It would have to allow people the flexibility to adopt whatever system it is to their local necessities. It would have to respect and incorporate local knowledge as much as possible. It would also have to create ownership by engaging farmers from the planning phase. It would have to develop the local capacity of, and leadership so as not to create dependence in the farmers. It would have to empower the farmers to mobilize and coordinate actions after whatever extension service is gone. It would have to foster connections with governments and agencies so that farmers can do their own thing. And it would have to link farmers to sources of finance. So all of this would be an ideal uh, extension model for FLR. So is this possible? Well, it's certainly easier said than done. And in the global south, we face particular challenges for this kind of extension system. Perhaps one of the most important ones is that public extension services were basically eliminated throughout the global south in the 1990s as a result of the structural adjustment policies. So we have that in some regions of Brazil, for example, 40% of the technical assistance is provided by vendors of fertilizers and chemicals, and that obviously uh, has its own set of challenges. And overall, we have an environment where research and development, government policies, the existing extension services, and the whole education systems all are designed to favor the use of conventional approaches to agriculture and natural resource management over agroecological approaches. So those are difficult challenges to overcome. Can they be overcome? Maybe. So to illustrate what an extension model for FLR would look like in reality, I'm gonna use a case study of the Colombian Sustainable Cattle Ranching Project, a project that was implemented in Colombia between 2010 and 2019. This project was based on a smaller, so Colombia, like so many other Latin American countries, has a huge problem with land degradation as a result of the widespread use of uh, unsustainable ranching practices. And uh, based on the success of a project that was implemented during the early 2000s, uh, the country decided that it was time to expand this project to the larger scale, to the national scale, implementing in five regions of the country. Now, this project fits the definition of an FLR project because from the get-go, it established multiple goals. The first one logically was to increase cattle productivity through the use of sustainable practices known as silvopastoral systems. But it also intentionally wanted to reduce land degradation and enhance connectivity, and it wanted to improve the delivery of critical ecosystem services. So this meant that it was a project that was combining sustainable agriculture and conservation and restoration in an integrated landscape approach. That's the definition of an FLR project, right? To achieve this, this project used two main strategies, technical assistance and capacity development. 
aka extension, and that's what I'm going to focus on. And it also used short term payments for ecosystem services. Now, you can think about this project as a big capacity development project. And why do I say this? Because the project had to reach more than 2,000 farmers initially in five regions of the country that were very different ecologically and socially. It had to introduce farmers to systems that were virtually unknown in some of the regions, not only introduce them to the systems, but convince them to try them out and hopefully to adopt them long term. It had to achieve widespread engagement among partners, and it also wanted to disseminate to a much larger audience to start a conversation about the importance of sustainable cattle ranching. It had a variety of logistical challenges to overcome because of the widespread, of the spread, geographic spread of where the farmers were located and just the difficulty of doing simple things like delivering trees to these farmers all over the country. It had to get farmers to sign up for a PES scheme that was difficult to explain. And it had to monitor all the land uses that were changing, uh, taking place throughout the project. All of this within a limited budget and time. So it was a bigger challenge in terms of capacity to develop. The project set its vision for extension. So the vision was to develop a participatory technical assistance model for cattle ranchers that was taking into account local realities and generated a shared knowledge process that guaranteed sustainable changes in farms. And if you read to this, I've highlighted a lot of things here clearly do not align with a conventional extension model. Now, from the perspective of creating an extension team, this project was facing a lot of challenges. So we know that the technical complexity of civil pastoral systems, the systems that they were trying to implement, demands a kind of specialized knowledge that is not available among farmers, professionals, conventional academia, or rural extension. This was certainly true in Colombia at the beginning of the project. Uh, back then, there were only a handful of professionals with the technical know-how required to implement a sustainable production and conservation project at the landscape level. So, and in many of the regions where they were working, the uh, level of professional capacity in these disciplines that were needed was really low. So the project pretty much had to accept from the get-go that if they wanted an extension service with the right skill set to implement what they needed to implement, they would need to train them from scratch. And that was a big challenge. So the first step was to recruit the extension agents. And they made the bold decision to use a role play exercise uh, that uh, filtered out these applicants mostly for personality traits and not so much for the technical knowledge because that they would have to, that would have to be provided to them through training. Once they selected this group of people, they assigned them to regional teams. Each of these teams uh, directed by a regional coordinator. And it's important here to mention that these regional coordinators were very seasoned extension and technical staff that had been doing this for many, many decades. So they had the practical training and the expertise to lead these teams. And this played an important role in the project. So the first step was to train these regional teams, these new extension agents as extension agents. And this focused on two basic components. The first was training in rural extension methods. This is something that is not taught in any university or technical institute in Colombia. So they were trained specifically, they were trained specifically in adult education. How do you transmit knowledge and ideas and methods to adults, which is very different from regular education, uh, both in individual and group methods. They were also trained in effective ways of communicating with this particular type of public and in methods of constructing knowledge with rural communities. The second aspect of their training was training in the technical aspects of the actual project, right? And for this, the project recruited a variety of experts in a lot of many different topics. These experts designed their own training models 
and they deliver them in two-day trainings to the regional teams with a focus on learning by doing, as you see in this picture, in one of the trainings that was delivered by LTA. So these teams were trained in a variety of topics that included the obvious civil pastoral system establishment, best management practices, pasture management, but also in a variety of topics highlighted here in blue, which were related specifically to conservation and restoration, like ecological restoration or functional biodiversity, and a range of other technical tools like GIS or how to monitor the economic efficiency of the farms. I want to highlight one specific topic of training that was used throughout this project and was extremely important, and that is participatory family planning. And that is when the extension agent sits down with the farmer to get the farmer to dream about the farm that he wants. And based on that, monitoring happens over the years to see how the farm has improved. Now, this was the methodology used from the beginning, and this made the project very participatory. This ensured that it's not the vision of the extension agent what is being implemented, it's actually the vision of the farm. So that was training the technical assistants or the extension agents. And then you have to send the agents out to the field to train the farmers. So this happened in what is called here a training cycle and this is a complicated diagram. So first, the training teams or the Regional teams would have these two-day trainings with their expert, let's say on something like pasture management. And after that, they would go out to the field for five or seven weeks to provide technical assistance to the farmers in a variety of ways. They would do individual farm visits, shown here in blue, to all of their farmers, 50 or however many they had. Uh, and they had a variety of group group training methods, like something called the ranching improvement groups, where they would bring together a few of their farmers to kind of discuss and work out through some of their problems. They also had workshops for larger groups and visits to each individual farm with the full group to understand and see what other farmers were doing. This was kind of the model that they were trying to follow. Okay, so after years of this, project being implemented. We had that uh, over 4,000 farmers who participated in this project received direct technical assistance from these extension agents. More than 2,000 external farmers that were not participants also received training. Over 20,000 people external to the project, professional and students, all kinds of people were attended some type of event where they were sensitized to the topic of sustainable ranching. The country after this project ended had 377 extension agents trained specifically for this kind of project and over 300 outside professionals that also have been trained. In terms of the results of the project itself, I'm not going to go into detail, but we can say that the rates of adoption of the sustainable practices were really high. The land use change that happened across all five regions was significant and a lot of existing forests had been protected. Now, some of the lessons that this project left in terms exclusively of extension. First of all, extension is a lengthy process. It cannot be rushed. I was told by many of the participants and people who uh, were in charge of this project that basically the first one or two years of the project were devoted to gaining the trust of the farmers. It was only in years three and four where implementation actually started to take off in a significant way. And this is something that you cannot bypass this kind of building relationships. Uh, the training in rural extension methods that the extension agents received was a key ingredient in generating this trust, right? It's not possible to get extension agents to communicate effectively with farmers if they haven't been trained specifically for this. The technical assistance that uh, they provided effectively increased the adoption of the proposed techniques. And this is reflected in the important figures of land use change that the project achieved. One important figure, the rate of spending between donor dollars and farmer dollars was from one to seven. This means that this myth that farmers are not willing 
to pay and they want everything for free is not true. Perhaps what they need is somebody next to them to explain to them why they are being asked to do what they're being asked to do, why it is important and why it's a good investment and somebody to actually help them to do this. And finally, uh, the free technical assistance that was provided became a really big motivator for farmers to sign up in the later rounds of the project. When the project continued opening applications a few years later, more and more farmers wanted to join, in part because of the free technical assistance. Of course, not everything worked in the project. There were a few things that perhaps needed or will need to be changed. One of them is the steep learning curve is not exclusive to the farmers. Extension agents also have a steep learning curve. So for future projects, probably it's a better idea to assign fewer farmers initially and later expand as the extension agents themselves, themselves gain confidence in their work. These regional improvement groups for cattle ranchers, these groups where farmers were supposed to work out their problems and invite neighbors and whatnot. It didn't really work. It sounded great on paper, but it didn't work because of the geographic spread of the farmers. It made it really unrealistic. Many extension agents mentioned that they would like to have uh, been more linked to regional networks within the regions. They some, sometimes felt a little bit isolated uh, one thing that I heard over and over, uh, extension agents wanted more flexibility to filter out the farmers that were not doing the work. Uh, so many of them complained that they had to spend a lot of time visiting farmers that when they knew these farmers were not going to work. This changed towards the end of the project where these farmers were filtered out, but that is something that they would like to see from the beginning. And uh, they also suggested the need they learned that they needed different strategies for different types of farmers. So some type of, some type of typology of farmers would be helpful to provide them the type of differentiated training that they needed. Okay, so this last section is based on my observations during the project. I traveled in the back of many motorcycles for many hours to visit farmers to conduct my research. I spent a lot of time talking and interviewing the extension agents and the farmers. And I also witnessed the extension agents doing their actual work. So these are my personal observations and what things that surprised me and that I want to highlight about the extension provided. Uh, first, I was surprised in how young and enthusiastic many of these extension agents were. And it's the way it needs to be because this is really grueling work. I was surprised to find many women extension agents. I really didn't expect that. Uh, and I was uh, pleasantly surprised. I was also surprised at how many of these extension agents were, had actually been recruited from the actual communities. Many of them had a farming background. Many of them were servicing farmers who they had known for their entire lives. And this made this process of trust building so much easier. For a lot of these extension agents, this was their first job opportunity, which they were grateful for. It's not that easy to find a professional or technical job in rural Colombia. Uh, I was surprised by how much training in a broad range of topics they had received when I, I often heard them speak about a variety of topics and it was all the result of the training in the project, for which they were very grateful for this continued opportunity to learn. Um, Many of them told me that they had learned more as extension agents in this project than what they had learned through years of university. And uh, many also expressed the importance of having a senior coordinator, regional coordinator above them, who was not a desk person or a bureaucrat, but actually a person who knew exactly what this work entailed, a person who had spent 20 plus years in the field doing this kind of work. During the farm visits, I also observed a few things about the relationships between farmers and their extension agents. I noticed that there was a lot of empathy and respect in this relationship. It wasn't a kind of a deferential um, relationship. It was more like an equal 
uh, when I would arrive to the farm to the extension agents, the kids would run out to greet us and it was, it was really a very collegial relationship. I was initially very surprised by how constructive and tactful extension agents were in delivering their recommendations and the style of learning that they were applying, which was very dialectic. It wasn't like, here's what you need to do. It was more like, okay, you have this problem. What do you think could be done? What could work? And initially I didn't understand this. I was surprised. Then I realized this is all the product of that extensive training that they receive in rural extension and how to communicate with farmers. One thing that I saw over and over again was a very hands-on attitude and this idea of leading by example. So for example, we would arrive to a farm and the farmer for whatever reason hadn't planted the trees that he should have planted a month ago, the extension agent would be like, okay, bring the shovel and let's go plant them. And they would just roll up their sleeves and do the work. And it was always kind of this leading by example attitude. I saw extension agents give up their free day, for example, and come together as a group to help a farmer who hadn't had the money to hire labor to plant the trees. So that was, that was really impressive to see. I saw a lot of adaptations of the systems to the specific needs of the farmer. Uh, so I came to this project with previous knowledge of civil pastoral systems, and it was interesting to watch how the same system was adapted in each farm to the needs, but also to the preferences of the farmer, and that is actually what extension agents should do. Uh, I saw a lot of relationships of trust between them to the point where these seasoned old farmers were asking these young people, extension agents, for advice on things that weren't even included in the project. And the extension agents, would they would go out of their way to do the research and bring them the solutions. Uh, so they would go like way beyond the call of their duty. Many farmers expressed a deep gratitude towards the project in general, but specifically towards their extension agent. A farmer you see in the top left, he basically told me he wouldn't have a farm today were it not for his extension agent. I also observed a deep sense of ownership and pride among the farmers. So these four pictures here are from a field day in one of the farms, in a demonstration farm. You can see the farm owner at the bottom showing his system. At the top left, you can see all the neighbors. They came together that day to sit down and listen to some extension people uh, give talks, but basically to walk around the farm and observe what, they knew, what their neighbor was doing. And the other two pictures are the two kids of this farmer. You see the girl on the top, she's taking attendance of all the people who came to the event. Uh, and the boy at the bottom, he's the one who does the PowerPoint presentation and presents what has been done in the farm in a very impressive and technically accurate way. I saw a lot of cross-pollination across the farms of the same extension agent. So, uh, what that told me was that this extension agent was not limiting to do individual training or assistance. He was actually bringing farmers from one farm to the next and they were sharing seeds and doing all kinds of um, kind of horizontal learning and that's the way it's supposed to be. I saw a lot of spillover to farmers and neighbors that were not participating in the project. And again, this is a really important aspect. Sometimes people doubt whether this actually happens. I did see a lot of this happening in this project. So uh, I was also impressed by the level of very deep knowledge that each extension agent has of all of the farms that he services. So if I would ask about a species, if they have tried it, someone would tell me, yes, I planted like, we planted like 15 trees of that, we can see them tomorrow. And they would remember the most incredible details of every single farm. And that is because many of them had participated in the baseline information assessment for each farm. They had actually walked every farm with the GPS in hand, so they knew them by heart. And then they had to do all of the monitoring of land use change. So they got to know these farms deeply. So something that is really important is that 
Extension agents over the years of doing this work, they gather an incredible understanding of what works and what doesn't. This is something that I tapped into during my research and it is a valuable resource for any type of project moving forward. They have perhaps the most intimate knowledge of what is happening and what exists. So in the Colombian Sustainable Ranching Project, I can say that in my opinion, the extension agents, they were very successful at engaging thousands of ranchers. Obviously not all of them, so people just don't want to uh, work in this and that's fine. Um, and extension agents were clearly very useful in helping the farmers scale up the adoption of sustainable management practices, not only in their agricultural lands, but also in all of the other parts of the farm, especially the conservation and restoration areas. So, my observation and that of many people who have evaluated this project is that I believe extension agents and the extension service and the extension model implemented here was an instrumental part for the success of the Colombian Sustainable Ranching Project. And it will be for the outcome of any future uh, project that stems out of this. And my final reflection is that I believe forest landscape restoration does need extension. Doing restoration at the scale that has been proposed is not going to happen if there is not some kind of capacity building and extension system. But I think that that extension system needs to deviate from the conventional model. It needs to build an eco ecological knowledge system. It needs to work with the farmers, consider their context, both cultural and ecological, and overall give the farmers the tools to apply their own ingenuity to the solution of the problems that they are facing. And with that, I can take any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Alicia, for your presentation. As a reminder to everyone, you can type your questions in the Q&A section, uh, and we'll get to as many as we can in the next few minutes. And also some people have been asking, uh, yes, this presentation is being recorded and we will be posting it to our website at the link placed in the chat here as well as our YouTube channel. Uh, so let's get started with, there are lots of questions here. So I'm going to kind of summarize and synthesize some and uh, hopefully we'll get to as many as possible. Uh, the first question wants to know uh, if you could explain more about the role play and how that worked uh, that you described of how it was used as a tool to identify extension agents. So uh, there's very little I can say about this because I wasn't part of this process, but it is something that uh, they brought up a lot during their, their interviews with me. Uh, how fun it was, like the whole recruitment process, which is supposed to be a very stressful process. Uh, I think what they did was they made them uh, play out what would you do in this situation, right? And you're the farmer and you're the extension agent and here's the problem. How do you act? And that's how they identified kind of, I believe, personality traits that would make them kind of uh, empathetic and uh, just good extension agents more than testing them on some kind of technical knowledge. There's a participant is asking, how feasible do you think it is to get funds to train extension agents for short-term projects? Is it advisable for short-term projects to train extension agents? I, I guess it depends on the short-term project. If it's a short-term project, I would assume it's not as complex as this project. And in that case, maybe you can find people already in the regional or local pool that have uh, the personality traits and the technical knowledge. Uh, what I can say is for a project of this magnitude, this length and the level of investment, if you don't make the effort to train extension, I don't think this is gonna work. I think it's a critical element for the success of any project. So uh, if, you, if it's a short-term project and there's no budget, at least some kind of effort to train the extension agents to do the work and to be more inclusive and to uh, bring in and consider the 
people's needs and the local and cultural context, that is, in my opinion, all money well spent. Is it easy? No. Uh, projects usually want to see their money in actual implementation, and things like research and extension are usually at the bottom of the list. So early in the presentation, you mentioned a lot of uh, theory behind uh, behind uh, extension and extension services. Um, and there are a few different questions about that. Uh, for FLR specifically, are there optional theoretical frameworks that are relevant? I haven't seen a framework of theory for FLR extension. And my guess is it's because FLR, we're still kind of in the making. And because FLR is this all-encompassing umbrella term, right? So in this case, for example, it's a project about sustainable cattle ranching, but an FLR project can be about a completely different thing. So I think um, coming up with an overarching model for FLR is not, maybe hasn't been done, or maybe I'm not aware of it, uh, but I do think there's I think that um, going off the principles of FLR and kind of doing the reverse engineering as to what, what kind of extension you need to accomplish those principles uh, is kind of at least the way I came up with. But no, I'm not aware of any uh, theoretical framework for FLR extension. Okay. Uh, there are some questions about uh, the women. You mentioned that uh, you were surprised that there were women uh, in addition to men as extension agents. Uh, were the cattle farmers comfortable with women or did you notice any uh, differences in the way in which women and men or female and male uh, extensionists interacted with the farmers? So this is actually something that I included in my questionnaires with extension agents. Uh, one thing that I have to say is that there were five regions of Colombia where this project worked. Women were not a large part in all of the regions, right? There are regions in Colombia where having a female extension agent might not be the most appropriate because of the culture or the most effective. But as far as my conversations with the women went, um, most of them expressed that they hadn't had any trouble uh, many of them said that actually they felt that they were treated better than their, their male counterparts. <clears throat> the farmers were like more gentlemen with them. And, uh, but I think mostly it was the male extension agents who told me that they thought that perhaps the women were not taken as seriously. But as far as the women extension agents that I talked to was, is concerned, they felt that they were uh, fine doing this kind of work. There's a bunch of questions about the kind of sharing of this experience, some having to do with the uh, le uh, kind of leaking out from the community of not just the farmers who received the extension services, but also people with whom they interacted in the community, um, as well as extension agents sharing their experiences with other extension agents or other stakeholders. Uh, do you have anything you could comment about kind of those effects of people beyond those directly impacted by the project? Yeah, sure. So in terms of uh, other people that were not directly participating in the project, uh, the project actually had that as one of its main strategies. They had a whole strategy, I think it's called dissemination and capacity building strategy, where aside from the direct training provided by extension agents, there are a bunch of people doing everything from small field days where everybody was invited to large events, like even an international conference on civil pastoral systems and a regional fora about sustainable cattle ranching. So there was, this was intentional, this was by design because Colombia is a country that I think is trying to build this transition towards sustainable cattle ranching as part of kind of its agriculture strategy into the future. So uh, at the beginning of this project, I said, I, I, I would think that very few people in Colombia would have even heard about sustainable cattle ranching. That has definitely changed as a result of this effort to widespread their message that uh, the project 
did. So that is something that was built into the project that I assume it had its own budget and uh, support from different institutions. As far as gathering the lessons from the extension agents, as far as I know, there hasn't been an effort. I actually am guilty of this. I conducted a lot of interviews with both farmers and extension agents. I have a lot of information. I haven't had the time to publish it, but I think there's like a treasure trove of information that can be gathered simply by sitting down and talking to extension agents about their experience. But I think not just in this project, I think this is a general flaw of most projects. Extension agents are this valuable resource and I don't think we're taking enough advantage of what we need. Yeah, one of the questions um, along those lines had uh, implied about doing some kind of exchange uh, between extension agents from one region to another or one country to another. So thank you for that suggestion, Debbie. Um, there's a question about um, how do we make sure that the top-down or paternalistic approach is avoided while also trying to mainstream predefined guidelines uh, for a system or for a project? Yeah, this is something that also came up a lot in my conversation. The project was really intent on not being paternalistic. From the top to the bottom extension agent, they were really adamant about things like handing out everything for free to the farmers. And that is why I mentioned that for every dollar of investment from the donors, there was investment from the farmers. This is not a project where the farmer was being handed out everything. The farmer had to put labor, if that's all he could, he could contribute, or the money to purchase the materials. Uh, so I think that's how you control this paternalistic approach. Uh, there were many farmers who wanted to do things and didn't have the resources. And in that case, again, I saw extension agents going out of their way to help them. Uh, but the approach is kind of like people have to put something in order to get something. Uh, I don't think that there's like a specific recipe of how to do this, but I do know that it was something that was permanently uh, in the minds of the people who were designing and implementing the project from the top to the extension. Um, Judith asks, what, I would like to ask whether there was an existing program before the project was introduced to the community, because this has been done in our province, and yet after the project and after the extension agent has retired, the program principles are forgotten. Yes. So Colombia had a previous experience, as I mentioned in the beginning, a pilot project that had been implemented in one of the regions. Uh, that project worked well. It's a project that had generated a lot of research, so it's out there to read. Um, that was the largest experience that had been implemented. So in that region, people, at least they had already heard about this. In some of the other regions, this required a whole uh, strategy of announcing, publicizing, and sensitizing people to the project before the project even arrived. What I can say is that the results of the project speak for themselves. I was visiting the farms in 2017, so towards the end of the project, one of the questions I got the most people, I don't know, they, I guess they thought I had some kind of influence for saying the project, but a lot of non-participants would come up to me during the field days and they would be like, we need another project, we really need to sign up. And this is not because they have been waiting for this for all of their lives. This is because they had seen the results of the neighboring farm and they were eager to sign up. So I think this is one of those things where Colombia has embarked in a very long process of creating awareness and doing the research, gathering the data to prove that this works. And now we're starting to see the results. That said, it has been a very difficult process. So it's not gonna happen overnight. Yeah. As one of the participants says, thanks for highlighting the role of rural extension to FLR. Funding agencies need to be aware of the importance of this work. Uh, so we probably have time for about one more question. Um, overall, the participants want to know, uh, looking towards the future, uh, what would you think would go into a new framework for extension projects? 
it's I think that, your whole presentation, but <laughs> I think the ecological uh, framework that I think one thing we have to admit is that um, FLR works with a different logic than conventional agriculture or conventional whatever production, right? Agroecological methods are a big part of FLR, even if we haven't articulated it in those exact words. So I think agroecology as a discipline has a long trajectory in extension methods, such as farmer to farmer, or uh, yeah, a whole bunch of methodologies for peasant pedagogy that have been developed in the discipline of agroecology. I think that's a good starting point. From then on, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I don't feel I'm the best positioned person to propose a framework, but I think, I think agroecology has a leg up on this and we need to start learning from a discipline that is completely aligned with the goals of FLO. Great, thank you so much, Alicia. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time, so I wanna thank you again for a wonderful presentation and for everyone logging in around the world for your participation. As we wrap up, I want to share with you um, some news about upcoming events. Uh, so uh, if you enjoyed this presentation from Dr. Kaye, uh, please know that she's an instructor in LT's one-year online certificate program, Tropical Forest Landscapes, Conservation, Restoration, and Sustainable Use. The next call for applicants will take place later in the fall. Uh, and you can learn more information at the website here, which we'll place in the chat momentarily. She's also a guest expert in many of LT's online and field courses in English and Spanish. And in the coming months, LT will offer a series of three online courses in Spanish for audiences in Latin America. Uh, these are on forest restoration, on agroecology and agroforestry, and on civil pastoral systems. We're still finalizing the details, but encourage you to contact us for the most up-to-date information and um, sign up for more information at this link uh, with, to, know, to be the first to know about the upcoming call for applicants. Here, I'll copy that information for you all. Uh, here's the information, which we'll also place into the chat now. Uh, so you can uh, check out our different websites, the LT website, lt.el.edu, uh, this link that we just placed in the chat to find, to sign up for more information about our upcoming online courses uh, for the online certificate program as well. And then the next lecture in this series will be perspectives on successful training uh, led by a panel of LT alumni. We're still finalizing the speaker lineup, so stay tuned for more information, which we'll post to uh, the web LT website for uh, this, uh, this training series as well as on social media. So thank you again to everyone for joining us today, for Dr. Kaye for an inspiring presentation and for getting us thinking about this important topic of extension services and how uh, the future of uh, FLR can uh, benefit from what's been learned in that arena. And we hope that you all stay safe and healthy during this global crisis. We hope this talk has served as some much needed inspiration and look forward to seeing you soon. So take care and see you at the next one.